All right, how you doing, everybody? Welcome back to Staying Focused for Jesus. In this sermon, we will be addressing the issue um, that people bring up in regards to the Bible versions, the Bible versions. Now, this is something that is dear to my heart, but it's not really something that we really have to argue about. Rather, it's amongst ourselves or rather it is amongst other people. Because once we go into the scriptures and we start to study the scriptures and allow ourselves to be led by the spirit, as the word itself says that uh, Jesus was going to send the spirit to guide us and lead us in all truth. Then um, once we are rooted and grounded in that truth, whatever that truth may be, in regards to the proper understanding of the scriptures and any doctrine, then there's really no argument about it. Now, we all go through our trials and tribulations. There are things that we think that are right, and we end up finding out that they are not right. And those things that we thought were right, a lot of times, they are because we are ignorant to a lot of facts. Um, things were, were kept from us purposely. So you can only come to a conclusion based off of the knowledge that you do have. But we are living in a day where God is revealing knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, not only his spiritual knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, but also physical knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that point toward him. And so when you have all this going on, we are able to better understand different things that we didn't know before. Um, we know that with the advent of the Internet and everything that we are we have at our fingertips so what i want to do is i want to go from the the very scriptures that people claim to believe and see what do the scriptures say because i'm convinced in my mind and i'm not really i'm here to convince you but i'm not here to convince you if you understand what i'm saying if you're watching this video then you're watching it for a reason you're not watching it by accident but if you watch it and you still decide that you don't want to believe what is being presented and you don't want to do your own research and truly be led by the spirit and not by the flesh, then, um, you know, that that's your choice. So if we go to the book of Matthew, chapter 21, starting at verse number 42. And it reads, Jesus saith unto them. So as clear as day, this is Jesus speaking to them. Did you never read the script read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. So he asks this question. Now he's bringing up scripture. He's quoting scripture to them and asking him, hey, didn't y'all read this in the scriptures? Again, this is Jesus that is saying that. And we know that the stone was him. Now, this is a prophecy about himself. So if we go with the notion that it doesn't matter what versions we read, then how can we truly say what scriptures that Jesus is talking about? How we know is not talking about a completely different set of scriptures. What we know today as the Gnostic Gospels. Because they had their, their writings back then also. They were writing stuff. How do we know that he wasn't referring to those set of scriptures? How do we know what scriptures he was referring to? Because if it doesn't matter, then it shouldn't matter at all. As long as the, the stories are similar, then we should be good to go. But that's not the issue with the different Bible versions. And we know for a fact that Jesus wasn't referring to some set of scriptures that the Israelites didn't know about, that the Pharisees didn't know about. He was referring to the oracles that had been passed down to them from God, a, um, a set of scriptures, a specific set of scriptures given 
by God to them. So today we have these um, different Bible versions and a lot of them, they do sound similar, but just because something is similar doesn't mean it's the same. If you take me and my brother and you put us both side by side, we look similar, but we are not the same. We come, we got the same blood. We got the same, same mama, same, we got the same family, but we are not the same. He is who he is. I am who I am. He has five fingers, um, five fingers on each hand, <laughs> uh, five fingers on each hand, five toes on each foot. So it's the same thing with these other manuscripts. They are similar to the true manuscripts, which gave us the, what we call today, the King James, but they are not the same. They are not the same. Just as you can have two Kelsen Kings. One of them can be a heathen and the other one can be a saint. We have the same name. We could have, we could have the same skin color. Our parents' names can even be the same. Let's just say, for argument's sake, that we had the same parents' names. But we are two different people. Even though we have similarities, we are two different people. So we know what Jesus was referring to when he said, did you, did you never read in the scriptures? So then we go to Matthew 22, verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. So the power of God is tied in directly with the scriptures. So when you have all these different manuscripts and all these different versions, then which one is the power of God? Because this is what the people that don't believe the Bible, they this is one of the main arguments that they bring up. Oh, y'all have so many versions of the Bible, you don't know what's real, you don't know what's fake. Even they understand this. So why is it amongst majority of professing believers and majority of pastors, there's this argument in regards to Bible versions? When the scriptures say that we are supposed to be of one spirit, one mind, one judgment, one body. So if we are supposed to be of one judgment, then how can we be of the how how can we be of the same judgment when you have people saying it is okay and it's not okay? Oh, it's okay to use all these different Bible versions because they they're all equal in power. Oh, it's okay to 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 not use them. That's not the same judgment. That's not having the same. That's not having the same mind. If we're being led by the same spirit, then why is there all this confusion when God clearly said that he is not the author of confusion? So again, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. So a lot of people are lacking power in their life, the true power of God, because they don't have the proper scripture. They have a counterfeit they have a antichrist looking uh, version who's coming with lying signs and miracles and wonders. Leading them to worship the antichrist. John chapter five, verse 39. Search the scriptures for in them ye think ye have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. So here he is again, here the Messiah, here Christ is saying what? Search the scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So he was telling them that if you search the scriptures, then you will see that the scriptures they are pointing to me because I am the true Messiah. The scriptures testify of Christ. So if the scriptures testify of Christ, that means that they, they, they are giving a testimony. And if, if a set of scriptures, they have something that is false, that goes against testifying of Christ, that means that they have committed perjury. That means that they are lying. 
which means that they are guilty of a crime. Well, that's kind of hard to accept if we go the notion that it's okay to use all, all every Bible version. Every Bible version is equal to each other because it is God who gave us the scriptures. So if God gave us a scripture that testify of not only himself, but of Christ, then that would mean that God's testimony that he gave to us in his word, it would be false. Which would mean that God lied. Now we know that God didn't lie. So are we supposed to believe that the God that we serve is perfect and he said that he was going to give us his word, but he is incapable of preserving his word perfectly. That's not a perfect God. That's not an all powerful God. That is a God that is capable of making mistakes. And that means that he isn't who he claimed to be. Again, and they, the scriptures are they which testify of me. You go to court. What do you do? You testify of somebody's character. Rather it be good or bad. And if you, if they find out that you lied under oath, what do they do? They make you put your hand on the Bible. If you, if you will found out that you lied under oath, then you are guilty of a crime. So if the scriptures are lying, that would mean that they are guilty of a crime. If we can compare the other manuscripts and the other versions based off of the King James version, which is what all the other ones compare themselves to. I wonder why, if we can look at these other versions and see if they commit perjury in, in essence by falsely testifying against Christ, then how can we trust these scriptures? How can we trust them? <clears throat> so now we go to Luke chapter 24, verses 25 through 27. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now, what did the prophets speak? They spoke the oracles of God and then they wrote it down. So how can you believe if you are wondering what you're supposed to be believing? What are we supposed to be believing? Is it the message? Is it the NIV? Is it the ESV? Is it the Dewey Reims? Which one, which one is it? Is it the, is it the King James? Which one are we supposed to be believing? What is the standard? What is the authority? Because for a person to say, okay, I'm going to lay the message Bible here. And I'm going to lay the King James Bible here. And they are of equal authority. Yet they contradict themselves. How does that work? Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So everything in the Old Testament, and we know everything afterwards, but everything in the Old Testament and everything up until this point, Christ expounded on and how they were talking about him. So he used the scriptures because they were familiar with it to prove that he was who he claimed to be because they always knew that the Messiah was going to come. The Hebrews always knew this. So I think a lot of the confusion comes in that is some of these people who are saying these things, they don't understand it from that, from that perspective. And they are teaching things that they ought not. We always knew about the, the Messiah. That's why Christ expounded on the scriptures. He expounded unto them 
in all the what? The scriptures, the things concerning what? Himself. He was using the very scripture that he had given them to prove that he was who the scriptures, which he had given them, he was that person. Now, again, what scriptures was he using? Was he using some false um, scriptures from the heathen nations? Was he using um, the false scriptures from, from um, the lineage of Ham? No. He was using the scriptures that they had. There was no confusion about that. So today we should not be confused about these things either. Luke chapter 24, verse 32. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he taught with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? So when Christ was physically here on earth, he gave them understanding in regards to the meaning, the, the proper biblical meaning of the scriptures. They didn't, they weren't arguing about what set of scriptures he was expounding to them. They knew what set of scriptures he was expounding to them on because they knew the word of God. They weren't arguing about this because they understood so if they understood, then we must understand these things today also. There should be no argument. How can two walk together except they be agreed? If you have one person that is supporting and saying the King James is the word of God, and you have another person that's saying, okay, we can use the King James, but all these others are equal in authority. You can't walk with that person because you, you can't agree. That's what the scriptures say. So I can't walk with a person if we're going to be arguing about this. At the end of the day, I have to stand on judgment day by myself, just like each and every person listening to this video and each and every person that claims they pick up, they're picking up the word of God and they are preachers or ministers or women of God. They will have to give it a given an account of themselves also. And I'm going to roll with what God has shown me and told me. If I'm wrong, then my judgment will be upon me. Luke chapter 24 verses 44 and 45. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms, what concerning me. So all the laws, all the 613 laws of the old Testament, they are concerning Christ. Everything the major, what we call the major and minor prophets spoke about. It was concerning Christ. This, all the Psalms and Proverbs, they were concerning Christ. So when he was talking about that, that's what he was, ta he was talking about the scriptures, because again, we know that Luke, all that wasn't written until afterward or whatnot. And they were giving their, um, their uh, account of what happened. So again, was there confusion amongst them in regards to what he was talking about? No, there was no confusion. They knew exactly what scriptures he was referring to. That set of manuscripts. They weren't arguing about, oh, it's, it's this set of manuscripts or whatever. Because when they had the people to copy the word, it was a very uh, um, tedious process. It had to be copied verbatim. As, as it is. And then it was checked too. So if they did that back then, how much more is God powerful? And so also, if we have the spirit of God dwelling in us, do we not have the discernment to be able to take this set of manuscripts, which you shall know a tree by its fruit. The fruit of the King James speaks for itself. The fruit of these false versions, it also speaks for itself. Are we spiritually incapable of taking the King James Bible, laying it down next to these other versions or even the manuscripts and looking at them and taking scriptures and seeing, Oh, this in this version directly contradicts what we know as sound doctrine that's contained in the King James. 
Are we incapable of doing that? Because we who are true believers know that the word of God, excuse me, does not contradict itself. So if we know this, then how can we continue to push and say it's okay for people to use Bible versions that are based off of a different set of manuscripts that came from the Catholic church who they got from the Egyptians. How can, how can we defend that? The basis of the Talmud and um, the Gnostic gospels and the the oral traditions of the 70 elders. That's where all this stuff comes from, the, those oral traditions. And then it branched off into these other religions. So if it's contradicting what we know as sound doctrine, then how can we support it? How can we continue to push it and say it's okay? I've covered videos of that in the past, and there are many other videos out there, and the information is out there where it shows you that these are not the same manuscripts. They're not the same manuscripts. And they contradict, directly contradict, not even just basic stuff. I mean, I shouldn't say not even basic stuff, not even like deeper stuff. But they do contradict even the basic foundational doctrines of the Christian faith. Now I can see an argument being had about the deeper things of God because there's not a lot of people that um, are in that realm of knowledge because they haven't grown up yet. But these versions, these, these different manuscripts, they directly contradict the foundational things. And that is a very, very serious issue. So in verse 45, he says, then open he their understanding that they might what understand the scriptures. So I ask you again, what scripture did he give them understanding of? Did he give them the understanding of the scriptures that they had and they knew because they grew up with it? Or did he give them understanding of the scriptures that were outside of what they were familiar with? Because this whole notion, oh, that this is something new where they're bringing in different uh, Bible versions and different manuscripts. That's nothing new. That's been going on forever. I'm going to prove it to you from the scriptures also. So since we know that they had other, what would we consider scriptures that weren't really holy scriptures, what understanding was Jesus giving them from what set of scriptures, the scriptures that they knew all their life that they grew up with and they, that was confirmed that Jesus was pointing them to or another set of scriptures. You see the, this is why sometimes not sometimes, but this is why, in each generation, God preserves a remnant of physical Israelites who understand these things to pass this knowledge on, to give it from that perspective. Physical Hebrews, if they were truly legit and they truly love the Lord, they never rolled with these false manuscripts and false, uh, false doctrine that people were trying to bring in into the camp. They never rolled with it. And even in that, even in that, Jesus when he was addressing the Pharisees, he told them to search the scripture. He said, you got it right there. You're just manipulating it and using it for your, uh, for your gain. First Corinthians chapter 15 verses three and four. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. So he only delivered what he had received. I can only deliver to you what I have received. How that Christ died for our sins, what? According to the scriptures. I ask you again, what scriptures? What manuscripts? Did he die according to the manuscript, the scriptures of the message or the NIV? No, because they make changes in it, which contradicts the very gospel and, and turns Jesus into some other God. I don't know that God of, of those. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to what? The 
scriptures. So Jesus just didn't come and do what he wanted to do. Everything he did was according to the scriptures to, to fulfill the scriptures. What scriptures did he fulfill? Did he fulfill the, um, the Alexandrian Egyptian scriptures? No, because they had their version too. Acts chapter three, verses 14 through 18. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. How can you have perfect soundness if you're not using a perfect word? If that's not your final authority. You have to have a final authority. We can't say that all of them are equal. There must be a final authority. If there is no final authority, then we're just flapping in the wind, claiming that we have the spirit of God and not really having the spirit of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. What do you say in regards to the power? He tied directly in with his word. The faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I walk, I walk, through, I walk that through ignorance ye did it as did also your rulers. You see, a lot of people... Before we were saved, we did a lot of things in ignorance. I spoke a lot of things in ignorance when I was I was younger. I was growing, I spoke a lot of things in ignorance. And then God took the ignorance away and gave me the revelation, he gave me the understanding. And then now, guess what? I had no more covering for my ignorance. God is God is removing the ignorance in regards to excuse me, this whole Bible version thing. So now there's no more covering for your ignorance. So if a person continues in it, then a judgment will remain upon their head because they are not ignorant to these different facts. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, should suffer he have so fulfilled. So how did God show before Christ came what was going to happen with Christ? He showed it by the mouth of all his prophets. Now, were the prophets contradicting themselves? No, they were not. Because then that would mean that how can we really know that Jesus was the Jesus that we know of the scriptures if the, if the prophets were contradicting themselves? Acts chapter 7, verse 52. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which show before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. So again, the prophets showed the coming of the just one. They showed the coming of Christ in the scriptures. Because that's what we read, right? We read about the we read what the prophets wrote. That were prophesying about what? The coming of the Christ, the coming of the Messiah, the coming of who we call the Lord Jesus Christ. So were they contradicting themselves? No, they were not. No, they did not. Even to this day, they do not and did not. So how is it okay if, if they didn't contradict themselves? How is it okay to exalt other versions that contradict the very Jesus that we serve. So now we want to go to the book of Acts. Um, well, Acts chapter 8, verses 32 through 35. The place of the what? The scripture which he read was this. So here's Jesus. He's going to read the scripture to them. Was he reading a completely different text from Egypt? From the lost world, America, from Australia and all these different places. Was he reading the scriptures from there? 
No, he was not. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a like a lamb dumb before his shear. So so open he not his mouth and his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this of himself or of some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So Philip gave him the interpretation of what he wanted to know. Philip gave him the interpretation through what? Through the spirit that that scripture was referring to Christ. So here's this eunuch. This eunuch from the lineage of, of Ham. Who wanted to know. What does this mean? So they have the scriptures in other places too. And you can go read the context and you can see that this was a, um, a Hamite. And he took this back to his city, his land, to the, uh, the queen. Acts chapter 13, verse 29. And when they had fulfilled all that was, that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. Did you catch that? And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him. So not only was Christ here to fulfill the things that were written of him, but the people during that time period, they were also there to fulfill the things that were written of him. So when I say that you're here to help fulfill the word of God, there's your proof and your evidence right there. We are here to help fulfill the things that are written of Christ. How can we fulfill the things that are written of Christ if we ourselves are contradicting ourselves in regards to what we believe? We can't. You're causing confusion. You're confused amongst yourself. In essence, you're fulfilling scripture because God is not the author of confusion. So he's giving you over to a strong delusion to believe these lies. But how can you fulfill what's written of Christ if you don't even know what's written? Because you're confused about what's supposed to be what? Acts chapter 26, verse 22. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. So, here is the man of God saying that, hey, I'm not saying anything different than what the prophets and Moses said should come. And I say it today. I'm not saying anything different than what they said. So you see a pattern. I'm not contradicting what Moses and the prophets said. I'm not contradicting what any of the 12 disciples, 12 apostles said, I'm not contradicting anything they said. I'm just expounding more on what they said because knowledge has increased just as Christ said it would in the book of Daniel. Well, you want to put it as Daniel said, by the power of the Spirit, or as God said directly to Daniel, however you want to put it. Daniel wasn't contradicting what, what Jesus said. Daniel wasn't contradicting what the father said. The angel that God sent wasn't contradic contradicting what the father sent him to say, what Jesus sent him to say, what the spirit sent him to say. I'm not contradicting anything that the father, that Jesus, that the Holy Spirit, that the 12 apostles, that any true born again believer said after that. And what any true born again believer is going to say after I'm gone, we're not going to contradict each other. We are on one accord. So what happens when you have another set of scriptures that contradict this pattern that God has set forth? I'm only expounding and giving more knowledge, wisdom, and understanding based off of the foundations that were set before me. Again, because knowledge has increased. So because knowledge has increased, I can give a greater revelation because knowledge has increased. 
other brothers and sisters in Christ can give greater revelations and greater understanding. That's why Jesus said, greater works that you would do than I did. Works of what? The Spirit. Our testimony would be greater because, because of the world that we live in. It's so dark. The world is darker when we came into the world compared to when they were in the world because things got worse. So now we go to Romans chapter 16, verse number 26. But now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets. So what? What's it telling us? But now is made manifest. It's manifest. It's coming to the physical and by the scriptures of the prophets. So the, the word of God, the Bible is a manifestation of, of something spiritual and we should get what that something is but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith so it was made manifest Christ was made manifest and the scriptures were made manifest the scriptures of the prophets why? For the obedience of faith. Now, how can you be obedient if you're having confusion? I should say, how can you be truly obedient if there's confusion amongst what it, what's supposed to be the standard, what's supposed to be the final authority? You can't truly have true 100% obedience, 100% 100% submission. That's exactly what's going on today. Look at the fruit. Look at the fruit. Just don't just don't read the scriptures and when it says you shall know a tree by its fruit and then oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at the deeper wisdom. Luke chapter 7 verses 16 through 23. And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God saying that a great prophet is risen up among us. And that God hath visited his people and his rumor of him and this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. And the disciples of John showed him of all these things. So John had his disciples at first because Christ hadn't come. But yet who was John prophesying about? He was paving the way for Christ. So the disciples of John, they came to him and they showed him, this is, this is everything he's doing. We think this is him. This is, this is him. We're talking about John here, John the Baptist. And we know what the scriptures say about John the Baptist. Now look what happens. And John calling unto him, two of his, two of his disciples sent them to Jesus so the disciples, they came back to John. They told him everything that was going on, what Jesus was doing. And then John sent his disciples back to Jesus saying, Art thou he that should come? Or look we for another? So John wanted to make sure that this was who he was supposed to be paving the way for. Like, is this, is, is this, is this you? Or am I supposed to just wait until somebody else comes? And in that same hour, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits. And unto many that were blind, he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and what heard. How that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to the poor. The gospel is preached and blesses he whosoever should not be offended in me. So the disciples of John the Baptist, they went back and they told John what Jesus said. Now Jesus could have easily just come out and said, yeah, I'm him. But he knew that John was going to do his due diligence. He, he, he told Jesus told um, John's two disciples everything that Jesus was doing because everything that Jesus was doing 
was prophesied in the Old Testament among the prophets and stuff. So John was going to go to the scriptures, not some scriptures that he wasn't familiar with that he didn't know about that contradict what he, what he did know. He wouldn't go to the true scriptures. And then that was going to be confirmation. Oh yeah, this is him. There's nothing wrong with having doubts sometimes as long as you take those doubts to God for God to truly show you. You see, John had, that was a doubt. Are you really him? He wanted to make sure. He, he, had, he, he had baptized Jesus. And he told Jesus, you have need, I need to be baptized of you. And then Jesus told him to suffer it, suffer it to be so right now to all things be fulfilled. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses one and two. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, troubled, neither by spirit, nor by what word, nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. So, even back then, you had people that were sending forth what we would call false spirits. He said, don't be troubled, neither by spirit, a person's spirit, nor by word, a person's words out of their mouth, nor by a letter as what? From us. So back then, you had people that were sending false letters under the guise of the true apostles of God under the guise of the true people of God. You had back then you had people speaking false words and operating in the spirit of unclean spirits. So as I said before, I was going to show you from the scriptures that this is nothing new. So if they were doing it back then, then don't we think that they are doing it today and that much more worse? Absolutely. We see it. We're talking about it right now to say otherwise is foolish and, and dangerous and reckless. And I'm going to give you even more evidence that this goes back further than that. And some of you shouldn't know where I'm going with that. Acts chapter 17, verse 31, because he hath appointed a day in the which he would judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given what assurance unto all men and that he hath raised him from the dead. So we have been given assurance. Oh, that doesn't include the, the a word of God. That doesn't include having assurance of the word of God. That we truly have the word of God. That doesn't include that though. Come on now. We know that's a lie. Or we should know. Obviously, majority of us, don't know because I wouldn't have to make this video if we did. Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17. And the works of righteousness shall be peace. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. So Christ came and worked the work of righteousness, which brought forth peace. Well, what, did, what was that work based off of? It was based off of what was contained in the scriptures. So the effect of the righteousness that Jesus came and worked, which was based off of the scriptures that were written, we now have what? Quietness and assurance forever, which means that we have assurance forever in the word of God, that God's word is true because he is true. Powerful stuff. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. That's how you're able to enter in. That's the clothing. That's the only way you can enter into the, the holy of holies. That, that's your spiritual credentials, the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, 
So when the veil was rent, that was a symbolization of the, the uh, flesh of Christ being rent to enter into the Holy of Holies, his blood being shed and then being sprinkled on the mercy seat, the blood atonement, and having an high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled, sprinkled with the blood of Jesus, from an e evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let's go back to verse 22. Let us draw near, draw near where? To God, to the Father, by the blood of Jesus. Let us draw near and enter in to the Holy of Holies with what? A true heart in. So the, the heart has to be in. If something is in something, it's in something. Water goes in a cup. Water goes in a bowl. So the true heart must be inside what? Full assurance of what? Faith. Now watch this. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith and full assurance of the word. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we're supposed to have full assurance, our hearts, we're supposed to have a true heart and full assurance of the word of God. I think that just struck some people right there. How can you have full assurance? How you can have, how can you have full assurance of the word of God if you don't even know what the word of God is? And you're saying that this is the word of God, that's the word of God, that's the word of God. It's all the word of God. It, it, it's all the same. Even though they are contradicting each other. They contradict themselves. Meaning that the spirits, the unclean spirits, they are contradicting themselves. Because they're walking in so much pride, they want their story to be told to exalt themselves because they want to be worshiped. That's what it boils down to. Genesis chapter two, verses 16 through 17. And the Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So, God gave the man a commandment. He gave him a commandment. He spoke his what? His word. And then we jump down to Genesis 3, verses 1 through 4. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, Hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the tree, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. What did God say? For in the day that thou eatest thereof, Thou shalt surely die. So I told you that this whole thing about Bible versions, you know, the Bible is supposed to be what the word of God goes way back to right here. And even before that, God said one thing and Satan came along and said something else. What, what did he, what did he say? He didn't say something brand new. He was manipulating the word of God. He was manipulating the word of God. Let's go back to verse number one. And he said unto the woman, yea, have God said, you should not eat of every tree of the garden. So didn't God say that? He did say it. 
So here's Satan manipulating the word. And then he lied, throws in his lie and says, ye shall not surely die. So he used the word as his foundation to get her attention because he knew that it was going to get her attention because she already knew what God had said. So here's Satan. In essence, he's changing what we would say today. He's changing the Bible version. He's manipulating the scripture. That's what it is. It's a manipulation of the truth. It's a manipulation of what God said. And this is what the other versions do. They manipulate the truth. That's why they have so many things that are similar and people are confused. The whole point is to cause confusion. He didn't go write his own, his own um, book. He didn't say something completely new. He started out with what God did say. He, and he posed it as a question. Then he threw in, you should not surely die. So the same thing is going on with these Bible versions today. They are starting out with the word of God and posing it as a question. In the beginning, did God say that he created the heavens and the earth? Oh, you should not surely die. <laughs> In the book of Matthew, God said, he did say, yea, have, yea, have God said, repent and believe the gospel? Yes, God said that we must repent and believe the gospel. And then the serpent sent it to the people. Well, let me back up. The, um, and stick on the serpent. Yea, hath God said, repent and believe the gospel? And then the people say, yes, God did say, repent and believe the gospel. And if we don't, we shall perish. And the serpent responds with what? Ye shall not surely die if you don't repent. All you have to do is believe. Because even we just believe. Repentance, that's just, say, you know, that's not what that's not what he's really saying. Now, realizing that they go hand in hand. So what happened? He manipulated the truth to deceive the people. The versions of the so-called Bible today, the fa their foundation is the word. They're posing questions and they're, they are manipulating the truth by changing stuff. And here it is right here, the same thing. So again, if Satan did it back here, you don't think that he did it he, and he's doing it today, manipulating and twisting the word of God. When we see him doing that all throughout scriptures and all throughout history, it's foolishness to say, to say that he doesn't do that. If a person denies that, then we know whose side they are most likely on. So all these people that are lying to you about these Bible versions, why aren't they addressing that? They're not going to bring that up. They're not going to bring that up. They're not going to make these points. Because they don't want you to think. They don't want you to be enlightened. Because that's the whole point. They want you to go to them completely. I want you to come to me because I'm going to tell you the truth in love. Not because I'm, gonna end, I'm the end all or be all. And I don't want you to ever grow up. And I want to deceive you. Psalms chapter 12 verses 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth. Purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. So how can the words of the Lord be pure if they're contradicting each other? That's not pure. That's impure. If you have two Bibles and they're contradicting each other, one of them is impure. And again, you go take these other versions that are based off of a completely different set of manuscripts that are similar to the true manuscripts, you go check these other versions, these other manuscripts, they contradict even themselves. And they are not pure. They contradict the very basis of doctrine, foundational doctrine that we believe. Funny how the Lord said that in the last days that people they would not take heed to sound doctrine. Sound doctrine is sound teaching. So what are we teaching? We are teaching the word of God. So how can you teach the word of God? If you're teaching it from something that's corrupt. And then you have no, no foundation. I can see if you, I can see if you're 
you got this version right here and then you're bringing it in as a witness so people can get a better understanding. You're saying, okay, this is still the final authority. But to tell people that it's okay, it's okay, they're all the same. That's a lie. For example, y'all know my standard, my final authority. In my videos, I go look up words from dictionaries and other places, right? So that people can have a better understanding of what's actually being said. Now, the definition that I'm giving, are they contradicting what the word is saying? No, it's not. It's just helping to give the people a better understanding that are listening who may not understand it if I just read it plain as day. I already understand what it's saying. saying. But what good does it do if I'm preaching and teaching and the people that I'm preaching and teaching to, they don't have a proper understanding of, okay, what does this word mean in the context of what it's saying? Okay, let's go look at this because you can understand this. Oh, now you have a better understanding. But am I leading you to rely on the etymology online.com dictionary? Am I leading you to rely on the Webster's 1828 dictionary and saying this is the final authority and this is just as equal with the word of God? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But this is what these people are doing. And that's what I have a problem with. Not so much if they if they're bringing it in and they're, you know, what I'm saying using it to help people get a better understanding. But even in that, if you're going to use it, you must break it down so that you don't cause confusion. Say, see, it says it's here, but we're not trusting it. We're just using this for X, Y, and Z or whatever. But they're not doing that. They don't have the spiritual fortitude to even do something like that because half of them don't even have the spirit in them. We could even say more than half. This is the final authority right here, what we're reading. Psalms 138, verse number two. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thy word. Sanctif sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So we're going to, so we're going to worship toward God's holy temple and praise his name. Why? For his loving kindness, for his grace and mercy and for his word. Oh, that sounds just like what? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then the word, what? Dwelt among men. The word was manifest in the flesh. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Oh, it doesn't matter though. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. It doesn't matter though. Proverbs chapter seven, verse number one. My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Well, how can you keep his words if you don't even know what, what version you're supposed to be using? Because they contradict each other. What words are we supposed to keep? The ones in the message? The ones in the NIV? The ones in the ESV? The ones in the New Living Tra Translation? Are, are all of them equal? Which, which ones are we supposed to keep? So let's go to our other set of scriptures and get ready to close this out. Psalms 119 verse 17. Deal bountifully with thy servant that I may live and keep thy word. How can you keep it if you don't know where it's at? Oh, it's everywhere. It's here, it's there. Here, little, there, little, everywhere, little, little. The message. We gotta keep the message, we gotta keep the ESV, we gotta keep all of them, because that's all the, that's all God's word. Right. Sounds like confusion. Then we go to verse 57 and it reads, Thou art my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep thy words. So if the Lord is our portion, then keeping his words, that's our portion too. But how can you have your portion if you haven't received your portion because God hasn't given you revelation of where the portion, which is the words are at? Did y'all understand that?
Thou art my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep thy words. If you're keeping his words, it's because you have received your portion, which is the Lord. Because the Lord has given you the words to keep, and he has given you these revelations and understanding through his spirit. As he said, he will give us his spirit that will guide us and lead us in some truth. Guide us and lead us in a quarter of the truth. Guide us and lead us and have the truth. Or maybe guide us and lead us in three quarters of the truth. Or maybe guide us and lead us in 99.9% .9 of the truth. No. Guide us and lead us in all truth. I got a shirt that says all truth matters. Then we go down to verse number 148. Mine eyes prevent the night watches that I might meditate in thy word. How are you going to meditate on it? You're going to meditate with 50 Bibles in front of you, the lexicon, the Greek lexicon, all the, all the different things and have no final authority. You run in circles. Your final authority is yourself thinking that you have, you have the spirit of God as the final authority. Your final authority is your own um, um, mind your own physical logic. That's the basis of of, of Satanism. Then we go to verse one fifty four. Plead my cause and deliver me. Quicken me according to thy word. How can you be quick and how can you be made alive according to his word if you don't know where his word is at? Luke one twenty eight. I mean, excuse me, 11 verse uh, 28. But he said, yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. How can you hear it if you don't know what it is or where is that? How can you keep it if you're confused about what's what? You can't. That's why he gives us assurance. Second Thessalonians. I think this is our last scripture. Yeah. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by what? By word or our epistle, by letter, whether by word or our letter, whether by word, meaning they physically, physically come there and talk to them, or the word in regard to the Bible or a epistle, a letter, which wasn't going to contradict anything that the Bible said in the same way. Right now you are reading if for however long you have been a part of this ministry, stand focused for Jesus. Some of you have been around for a long time. Some of you have been around for a short time. Some of you, this is your first time. Guess what you are doing? You are reading the gospel according to Kelson King. If I come to your ministry, I'm, I'm reading the gospel according to insert your name. So when I read it, I read your testimony. I read what you're saying. I'm seeing, does it line up with my testimony, which lines up with the, the apostles and the men and women of God who came before me? which lines up with the testimony of Jesus. That's what we're doing. That's what we're supposed to do. That's how you try the spirit. My gospel, which is the gospel of Christ. That's why Paul said is my gospel. It is mine. It belongs to me. It's, it's in me. Hopefully it's in you. My gospel isn't going to contradict the gospel of the apostle Paul, the apostle John or the apostle Peter. Because their gospel that they had is the same gospel that I have, which is the gospel of Jesus. So when you listen to a person and their, their account of the gospel contradicts what you have been taught from the true gospel, which is the basis of me being able to preach today and give the gospel according to Kelson King, then that's how you know that they are false. Whether it's by word, by the written gospel, gospel we have here, or our letter. So these are like letters that I'm, I'm writing to you. They just, they just, um, 
They're digital. But again, my testimony doesn't contradict the testimony of the prophets and the men and women of God who came before me. So if our testimony doesn't contradict each other, then how can you support and defend Bibles that defend, I mean, that um, contradict each other and exalt them to the same authority as the word of God? They're not, they're not even on our level. In the same way, those other versions, they are, they can, you can get stuff from them. I'm not going to sit here and say you can't get nothing from them, but they are not on the same authority as the authority of the word of God that we just read. So um, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and close it out. God bless each and every one of you in Jesus Christ's name. I hope this video gave you some things to think about and to meditate on and take it before the Lord. Uh, God bless each and every one of you in Jesus Christ's name. As always, stay focused for Jesus. And as you know, truth is not debated. It is declared. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If it was edifying to you, be sure to do your part and share it on all your social media outlets, websites, and forums. Your help is greatly appreciated to help fight this war and reach lost souls. Don't forget to like, dislike, and or subscribe. Be sure to also check out our website, stayingfocusedforjesus.life and make sure you check out that resource section, which has a lot of videos that I share and some other stuff, books, um, documents, PDF websites, many, many things. And it's growing daily as I add to it. Also follow us on Facebook for even more content, staying focused for Jesus on Facebook. Till there's nothing left until we pass out Keeping us around to clean up the mess And take the garbage out, but we'll be trash next Create catastrophes to speed up the process Depopulation, agenda, progress News tell half-truths, hidden in plain sight They know we the Kool-Aid, but gave us cyanide They know we don't see they know. They know you can't see it. see it. What they've done to us. Open your eyes. Lemonade. Don't drink the Kool Aid. It ain't safe for us. They made it so sweetly, so it will be easy to carry the plans out to live. Pay to receive fabricated knowledge False education, stand in ovation For my degree in indoctrination Georgia Godstones plainly tell us That they plan to eliminate us Conspiracy theory, we see no dilemma As they quietly wipe out billions They know we don't see they know you can't see it They know What they done to us Taking us down Lemonade Don't drink the Kool-Aid It ain't safe for us they made it so sweetly So it will be easy To carry the plans out To eliminate us
scenes like Geppetto Pulling the strings, master plan, dumb us all down Eat what they feed us, try not to think Carry on, nothing to see As they continue with their killing spree We waste some time on trivial things and buy what